been writing to the church about living in exile. It's a constant theme of the New Testament. It's an exile from which we won't be delivered until the Lord returns and destroys all earthly authority and powers and establishes a consummated new heavens and a new earth. Today, we're going to begin considering the most intimate aspect of living in exile, the institution of marriage. Paul tells us, since then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And it's significant to Mark Paul's words there, he doesn't say don't set your mind on worldly things which might have to do with a kind of a philosophy that discounts God, but he says don't set your mind on earthly things. Over the past perhaps 50 to 70 years the thinking of American Christians has become very earthly. The early church fathers, the reformers, the best of the theologians through the 19th and 20th centuries held in their minds a paradigm of what God was doing, the purpose for which he created the world, the purpose for which he created mankind, the destiny to which it was moving, the, uh, the, the, the disaster, the catastrophe that happened and what he did to undertake its restoration. But it's a paradigm which many Christians today are ignorant of. Peter began his letter telling us that God in his great mercy has given to us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And if you don't understand the paradigm against which the apostles are writing... Uh, and a, a paradigm that was ably expounded by the early church fathers, then when we come to this passage of scripture that I'm going to read today, we're going to think that it sounds like rather mundane, pious advice of how to have a good marriage. It's a kind of a self-help book of principles for having a good marriage. And so God willing, in the coming weeks, we'll look at the specifics of what Peter has to say and what it means for uh, husbands and wives. But what I have to say about that will be confusing or be misunderstood by you if you don't understand the paradigm of what God has done and what he's doing. And so I read today from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. This is God's word. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may, may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they, say the, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives... Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. And you are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives according to knowledge and treat them with respect as the weaker vessel and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, live as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his, and his lips from deceitful speech. 
He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And Father, as we come into your presence today, give us submissive spirits and hearts to your word and to your authority over us as our Lord. That, Father, your ears would be attentive to our prayers. For we, Father, have been cleansed, having been cleansed of our sins by the Lord Jesus Christ, would live out that righteousness. And that, Father, you'd grant us your grace and your peace, that we would grow in both. And so honor you, looking forward to that great day to which you've appointed us. And that you, Father, in that would be glorified all the more. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, I mentioned before that Peter began this letter rooting what he is about to say in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we've been given a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus is the turning point of history and we are called to live in the light of the reality that that resurrection brings right now. Now it was through the prophet Isaiah that God had promised that there would be a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation. And the apostle Paul tells us that Jesus is the firstborn of that creation in Colossians 1.15. And what Paul is referring to is the new creation. That Christ in his resurrection is the firstborn of that creation. There's more to follow. And so in the resurrection of Jesus, the new creation has begun. It's now awaiting consummation. It's uh, waiting, as it were, for the rest of creation to catch up. And if you are in Christ, you are already a part of that new creation. That's what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he is new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And yet, the Apostle John, in his first letter, speaks to us of the, of the experienced reality that we all know. And he says this, Beloved, already we are the children of God. Already we are new creation in Christ. And yet, it has not yet appeared what we will be. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. The incarnate Christ in his resurrection is the new creation to which all of creation will be conformed. In contrast to this first creation, which now continues. And Christians, those who are united to Christ, are in the unique position of being both a part of the new creation and a part of the old creation. If you as a Christian sometimes feel stretched, it's because you are. The resurrection of Jesus forms the boundary event of the new creation. Now, you know, uh, it's been widely recognized since 1929 that the, that the universe had a beginning. Up until that time, physicists, cosmologists, they all thought that the universe was eternal. But, uh, but in 1929, through the convergence of some things that were observed by the astronomer Edwin Hubble and by some mathematical principles that were worked out by Albert Einstein, they realized that the universe had a beginning. 
And as uh, Robert Jastro, a physicist who uh, used to work with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, once said, he said, you know, he said, we, we've, we've, we've scaled the, the cliffs of ignorance and pulled ourselves up over the highest peak only to find a band of theologians that have been sitting there for centuries. It's been widely recognized since 1929 that the universe had a beginning. And given the universe, we can understand its laws, right? We understand things about the universe. We understand gravity. We understand the strong and weak nuclear force, electromagnetism. We understand the conservation of energy. Uh, we understand laws of motion. But all of those things are just simply a description of what actually happens in the universe. Before the universe began, those things didn't exist. The universe itself is the boundary event. Christ's resurrection is the boundary event of the new creation. And we still live here in this old creation, but the resurrection of Jesus changes everything for us. And the schema that is often overlooked and unappreciated today is, is this. Let me, let me make the statement and then I'll unpack it because I'm going to use some big words here. For the, for the early church fathers, eschatology informs and interprets protology. As all that is to say is simply that for the early church fathers, what they said is that in, in God's creating of the world and what its purpose and destiny was, if we want to know what that was, we need to look at the end of the story. We need to see where he's, he's bringing it, what he's going to do. And so if we want to understand what the first creation was all about, we have to look at what the Bible says about the new creation. And so the common misunderstanding, I think, today is that the creation account tells us of an earth that was essentially finished and perfected. It was just supposed to be like that. It wasn't really going anywhere. It just was all done, and that was kind of the end of the story. And uh, the idea that I think a lot of people have is that if, if man had not sinned, things would have just gone on forever as they were. And so, in that idea, Christ's redemption uh, consists simply in putting things back to the way that they were in the garden. But the schema that the early church fathers had was different as they, as they, as they looked at the, 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 the end of the story. They noted that God had created mankind in his own image and likeness. And they noted some other things too. They noted that when God created the universe, he didn't just kind of snap his fingers and everything uh, was the way it was, but that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was formless and void. And through a period of successive steps, God formed and filled that chaos and made it a cosmos. And when God was finished doing that, and as far as he was going uh, to work independently, we're told that God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But as my old theology professor, uh, Richard Gaffin, used to say, God pronounced his cosmos very good. He did not yet say it was the very best. Man was created... Uh, in the image of God, and he was given a task. And we're told in Genesis 1.28 that task was to subdue the earth. Now that's interesting language because subduing is fighting language. It wasn't, it wasn't manage the earth. It wasn't steward the earth. It was subdue the earth. And to subdue indicates a fight. To subdue is to wrestle into submission. In fact, the, the, the Hebrew lexica will tell you that to subdue is to dominate by force. And, and you have a kind of an echo 
of a formless and void that is, that is what? That's wrestled into a cosmos. And man, as the image of God, was to wrestle the creation and by the obedience of faith to cause a boundary event that would usher in the new creation. And the, the base of operations was Eden, the place where, where God met with man, and yet that garden was not something that man did. It was something that man was given by God. And what Adam failed to do, Christ has done. It's not merely that the first creation was corrupted by sin, although it was. It's that because of our sin, the first creation never attained to what it was supposed to become. What Adam failed to do, Christ has achieved. And the first creation has now been infected and effected by sin. But even in its pristine innocence, there was a difference between the first creation and the finality of what God had planned. The garden east of Eden is where heaven touched earth. It's very evident when you read the first chapters of Genesis that the whole earth is not the garden. And Adam's given the task of subduing, of wrestling the earth into submission, of bringing the blessing of Eden to the ends of the earth. And the fathers noted that. Uh, many of the church fathers also noted that when we look at the first creation and man in his innocence, that God's presence with man was sporadic in the first creation. Uh, think back, when you think of the fall of man, to those who are recorded, uh, who are present at the temptation and the fall. And who do we have there? We have the serpent. We have the woman. We have the man. There's no mention of God. And when you read the account, you feel his absence. God is not there present to their senses. In fact, we're told in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 that when the man and his wife had sinned, they sewed fig leaves together, they hid themselves, uh, and we're told that they hid themselves particularly when they heard the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In, in other words, the indication is that God wasn't present with them all the time, not to their senses, only at periods of time. How different that is than the new creation. In the new creation, God's presence with human beings will be perpetual and perceptible. And the Apostle John writes in Revelation 21, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. That, that, that in the new creation, in the creation uh, of which the first creation was the first stage, that there's going to be no place, no experience to your senses in which God is not perpetually perceptible. And all that to say that it was not the plan of God that the old creation would continue forever. But by the obedience of faith... That creation was to form the scaffolding of the consummation of creation. And of what the New Testament calls the new creation or uh, what Isaiah does as well. So that the event that the theologians call the fall, if you picture this right, was not that there was this completed artifice that an earthquake came and destroyed, but it was of a building under construction that an earthquake came. And destroyed. Now what's the point of all that background? The point of all that background as we begin to look at these passages in Peter is simply this. Marriage is the ordinance of the first creation. 
the words that open uh, our marriage ceremony and many other Christian marriage ceremonies uh, are these. Marriage is an institution ordained by God in the time of man's innocence and uprightness. And those words are absolutely true. Uh, marriage is an aspect of God's very good first creation. It has among uh, its other purposes, and there are more than one purpose, there's more than one purpose to marriage, but uh, among its purposes, it has the purpose of populating the earth. Marriage is an institution of the first uh, creation. It is not an institution of the new creation. Now, I'm going to show you that from the Bible, but let me say... Uh, to our young people, our young married people, or those who aspire uh, to being married, that I know that the idea that marriage is not an institution that carries into the new creation can be disturbing for you. I know that because when I was a young married man, it was disturbing for me to realize that the teaching of the Bible is that marriage, human marriage, is not an institution of the new creation. But Christ is risen. And the boundary event has occurred. And if we are his, we must be transformed by the renewing of our minds, even here and now. And, and so let me say particularly to our younger people, that if, you can, that if you can check your emotions for just a moment... I hope you'll see that the fact that your, your marriages or anticipated or hoped for marriages serve a much greater purpose than you could have ever imagined in light of the resurrection of Jesus. But it's important that we be clear on the Bible's teaching. Human marriage does not carry over into the age to come. Now in Matthew chapter 22... Um, Jesus is confronted by some Sadducees and we're told uh, in Matthew 22 that same day the Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. The question that they come with isn't a sincere question. They think that, that what Jesus is teaching is silly, it's nonsense. And they're trying to trip him up. They're trying to show by this question, it's a hypothetical question, how, how silly this idea of the belief in a, a future resurrection is. And so they say, teacher, uh, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now, this is an institution of the Mosaic law called leveret marriage. And what it simply meant is that to preserve the, tr the lines of one's family, that if a man was married uh, and, and, uh, and, and he died and he didn't have children, that his brother was to marry the woman, marry the widow, and the first child would be accounted the child of the deceased man so that his line could continue. So that's what they're referring to. Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, uh, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? You see the point there? Jesus, do you see how foolish it is to believe in the resurrection? But listen to Jesus' response. He replied, you are in error because you do not know either the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you never read what God said to you? I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Marriage is not an institution of the new creation of the age to come. 
And so in anticipation of that, in Matthew 19, uh, Jesus said that there would be some people who would be celibate for the kingdom of God in anticipation of living for the kingdom of God. Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In fact, said that he himself lived that way and he encouraged it. And yet both Jesus and Paul say that not all have the same gift, indicating that marriage is here and now indeed a gift. But as respects the first creation, what is the purpose of marriage? Well, again, our wedding ceremony, which is common among Christian churches, give several reasons for marriage. It's an institution between one man and one woman for the honor and the happiness of mankind. Uh, it is given for the enrichment of the lives of those who enter into it. It is given for the orderly and uh, safe context in which to bring children into the world. And that, my friends, is true for all humanity. This isn't, this isn't just a kind of a Christian thing. This is a creation ordinance. This is true for all mankind. Now, today people may kick about that. They, they, they may try to redefine marriage. But this is, in fact, and in truth, what marriage is. But for believers, marriage is an ordinance in order to the fullness of the new creation that's been begun in Christ. And so particularly for Christian marriage, it is, as our ceremony says, for the glory of the covenant God. God is glorified in our redemption and in our glorification, of which the New Testament frequently speaks. That our hope is a hope of glory. And the Bible repeatedly uh, says that God's plan is for us to be conformed to the image of his son. Now certainly... In this time now, between the times, that means for you and me to be conformed to Christ in his humiliation and to enter into his suffering. But why does Paul say that we do that? He says so that we may share in his glory. That Jesus' humiliation was in order to his glorification. And in him, we are to receive glory. Peter began his letter talking to us about that. He said in the first chapter, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perseveres even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. That's the goal to which God has destined his people. A destiny, a future of praise and glory and honor. So what is Paul talking about when he says that we'll be conformed to the image of his son? Well, what does Jesus look like in his glory? John gives us a picture. He said, I saw one like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. And his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. God's created people made in his image are destined to bear the fullness of what it means to exude the image of God. 
And I get the sense of the weight of everything that I read in the scriptures that God's people are destined to become creatures from whom angels will avert their eyes in embarrassment. Now what does that have to do with Christian marriage? Um, in what was originally a lay sermon... Uh, now it's recorded in a, a book that bears its name. It's the first chapter of it, The Weight of Glory. C.S. Lewis wrote this. Now this is about our obligation to one another. But I want you to listen to it as the obligation of husbands to wives and of wives to husbands. It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter, it is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it and the backs of the proud will be broken. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are, in some degree, helping each other to one of these destinies or the other. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all of our friendships, all of our loves, all of our play. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This does not mean that we are to be perpetually solemn. We must play, but our merriment must be of that kind, and it is, in fact, the merriest kind, which exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption, and our charity must be a real and costly love with deep feeling for the sins in spite of which we love the sinner, no mere tolerance or indulgence, which parodies love as flippancy parodies merriment. That's the purpose of your marriage. To help one another to attain the destiny for which God has ordained, appointed his people. <clears throat> 